Hi all, let's have a look at game five played today. So Magnus Carlsen playing white against Fischianand. He kicks off with actually c4, so not the ratty opening with knight f3, but instead c4, the English opening. e6 is played by Vichy. We see d4, d5, so a transposition into a queen's gamut declined. And now after knight c3, another transposition into the semi-slav. So the bishop's inside the pawn chain, which sometimes can be an issue. Uh, so the semi-slav, or sometimes called the triangle because of that triangle formation of the pawns here. Now we see a very interesting move, e4, and this usually heads to the Marshall Gambit. So that's named after Frank Marshall, who was a very, very famous uh, American attacking player. And he had very, very brilliant games sometimes. One was so brilliant, uh, the board was apparently showered with gold coins. And there's a, a video on this channel, I'll put a link to that if you're interested. So it's the Marshall Gambit is usually um, black takes on e4 here. And after the knight takes e4, uh, we see bishop b4 check, which is quite an annoying check because the idea usually is for white to play here bishop d2. But surprisingly a little bit, Magnus didn't play this move. This is actually the main move, bishop d2. And you can have quite scary um, complications arising from this. For example, queen takes d4. This is the proper martial gambit. Bishop takes b4. Queen takes e4 check. Bishop e2. White has quite a dangerous position here. And after knight a6, uh, the idea is bishop a5 in this position to threaten queen d8 uh, mating. And the gambit is described as have giving white no theoretical opening advantage, like from an engine point of view, I guess. But it actually, in practice, it scores very well. So that means it's an easier to play position, usually, for the player with white. So for black, the, the conclusion from this is that they need to know the variations very, very well if they go into them. But uh, the martial gambit stuff was kind of sidestepped with knight c3. So this is not so common. Knight c3, uh, that retreats. Now black strikes at the center, quite logically, it would seem, with c5. And let's put on uh, an injured bit to here. So c5 uh, from Vichy. Uh, so now white wants to sort of strengthen his center. If he plays something like d5, that could lead to trouble. This, this center is not, not too stable here. In fact, black might even be slightly better already after knight f6. So Magnus wants to bolster his center and he encourages black to double his pawns. He plays a3, welcoming, welcoming totally the doubling of pawns here. This would be really quite comfortable for white if bishop takes, b takes. That's exactly what white needed. So he's got the bishop pair and the strengthening d4. Slight advantage for white. So Vichy decides on bishop a5 here. This was the intention. So keeping the pin on the knight, keeping the pressure on d4. We see now knight f3. And in these uh, scenarios, you'll see that the three pawns here might actually form a majority on any c takes d4. We have a majority of pawns on the queen side potentially. So black might not be too keen on, for example, c takes d4. If, if for example, we had an exchange of queens, you'll see that this end game scenario um, could be quite favorable to white. Although, you know, even if, okay, if black tries to puncture the pawns, then we have the two bishops. So we're going to end up with, with some trump uh, cards here to play with, whatever happens. So it's quite dangerous to, to do this c takes d4, uh, releasing the tension. Vichy, instead, he plays knight f6, and we see bishop e3. And now again, refusing c takes d4, black keeping the tension in the center with knight c6. And you might think, well, can white take this pawn? If we, if this pawn is taken, we can end up with treble pawns, which look quite fascinating, these treble pawns. Um, and it, it might offer technically, at least from an engine point of view, a slight advantage. Uh, but I think black can even threaten to further damage the structure here with knight g4. And this, this sort of position is, is going to be only slightly better uh, for white. Uh, so but that's interesting to have momentarily treble pawns. You can see that this c5 will be a target for knight g4 and queen a5 in any case. So 
we see here uh, a very very interesting uh, move actually. Another alternative is Rook C1, but Magnus actually played Queen D3. And this promises a very, very exciting game with the possibility, in theory, of casting queenside. And in fact, this is something I tweeted during the game that, you know, maybe White's preparing to castle queenside. I didn't really believe that would happen, though. But let's see what happens now. Um, I thought there's only a faint possibility because he hasn't moved this bishop. And sometimes that is that is a clue to White's intention of casting queenside here. We see C takes D4 now, so finally C takes D4. I think White might actually be threatening uh, to take under more favourable circumstance here. D takes under a much more favourable circumstance. So C takes D4, Knight takes D4, and now not routinely castling. If Black routinely castled, then something like B4 might actually be quite pleasant for White. He wants to use this majority of pawns on the queen side. And you know this this would even help mobility further in the long run, and white white would have a nice advantage there. So we see a move which is not stereotypical. It's a very precise move. Knight g4, trying to undermine indirectly d4 or fracture white's pawn structure a little bit. Magnus is not too bothered about this. He just castles queen side now, not minding this possibility of knight takes e3. Let's see what else can um, Black do. Well, I think Black has to follow with with Knight takes e3. If Knight takes d4, uh, for example, Bishop takes d4, this looks pleasant enough for White. Uh, in fact, White can even uh, if if White gets this position, it it just looks fairly pleasant to have the structure you know virtually intact, and then the Knight can be kicked back later. But um, no, after castling, knight takes e3 was played. Now, if queen takes e3, this actually runs into a very nasty pin, bishop b6, uh, which is difficult for white to do something about. Um, it's very, very awkward to, to try and defend uh, this, uh, to leave that pin. If, if castles here, queen c3, Okay, knight takes, knight takes. There's another potential pin, or at least to try and wreck White's structure, and also attack f2. There's a lot of pressure here with Black threatening now rook d8. So this pin is not to be uh, welcomed after queen uh, takes e3. So we see knight takes e3, queen takes e3 is not well. Doesn't Magnus doesn't want to entertain that? He accepts some structural damage. Um, in chess, sometimes you have to give something to to get something. So here, okay, he's got more pawn islands. He's just created a new island here. But on the other hand, there's potential dynamic play along the f file as well, which could be useful later. Uh, so we see now Bishop c7. What is White actually threatening here? Maybe um, b4 or Knight takes c6 is on the cards, but Bishop c7 again not castling routinely if black had castled routinely this might uh, there's no knockout blow or anything with knight takes c6 this might be okay because the bishop's holding d8 that that does seem a valid alternative actually just to castle there but uh which is bishop c7 was played instead and we get an interesting uh, aspect of this position being highlighted now because Magnus actually just plays knight takes c6. He's welcoming quite a lot of exchanges here. So two knights come off and the queens come off. Now queen takes d8 is played. Bishop takes d8. Bishop e2. This bishop does seem better than its counterparts on c8 here. Seems more active. Uh, this structure, which is classic in the Slav, does sometimes damage the mobility of this bishop. Uh, King e7, but you know, black in theory has this bishop pair, which could be very useful. But uh, this knight can, in this position, be quite dangerous. In particular, in this position, if black's not careful, and say, say um, he castled here, then the knight is ready to do some maybe jumping into these these dark squares, particularly d6. So Vichy's move helps at least. To control d6, uh, for example, bishop f3. If if black went 
passive in this position, then getting a knight to either c5 or d6 is, is fairly unpleasant potentially. Uh, either like c5 and then knight d6 or rook d7 here and knight d6. This starts to be unpleasant. So by putting the king on e7, black's helping control that d6 square against this kind of knight maneuver. But the knight still has it has two potential useful squares, but there's more pressure points. c6 in the position to this bishop is useful. And Magnus plays that first, bishop f3. And now he makes use of knight e4. So there's these two dark square pressure points. But we see bishop b6, which does attack e3. And you might think, is there time for a gambit of some sort to play this knight d6? Because knight d6 could threaten all sorts of things, like knight takes f7. If the king's just holding f7 and d7 here, there's not quite enough time for knight d6 as a pawn sack. If bishop takes e3, king c2, okay, white's threatening now rook he1 and maybe even knight f5 if the bishop moves. But black actually has a very good um, a resource here. Uh, a number, maybe one or two good resources, but f5 would do the trick uh, to kind of neutralize any, any problem with the king on e7. So white's not keen for this pawn sack here. He actually just chases the bishop with c5, but it doesn't have to move. And in fact, it's best not to move it back because the knight coming to d6 would be a horrendous problem. If bishop c7, knight d6, we are now threatening. Knight takes f7 with the bishop being loose on d7. And this is just horrible actually for black, this kind of position. Um, it's it's uncomfortable. If rook h8, white can just build on the d-file, say with rook d3. Uh, now going to double rooks and again renew the threat of knight takes f7. It starts to be quite unpleasant. Okay, so there's something radical played after c5. Bishop just counters now with the move f5, and it looks a little bit horrid to do this because potentially he's he's just created uh, more pawn islands in his position. Uh, you'll see that. That that pawn island was intact, and now we've got this extra one here, which I suppose is a mirror image of this this e3 one, which Magnus welcomed earlier. So we see now, uh, if the knight moves, it hasn't got anywhere useful to move uh, because of bishop takes c5. So we clearly have to just take that bishop now. Now after f takes, Magnus slips in a very clever move. Uh, instead of bishop takes e4. Black uh, would be quite comfortable here after a takes b. It's um, not as fragmented here. These pawns together, they strengthen each other uh, together rather than being isolated. And also, Black's a file would be quite useful. Maybe even things like b5, b4 later. No, Magnus slips in a very clever in between move. He plays actually b7 here, hitting the rook. So by that, by that delay, hitting the rook. Now we see a slight different picture in terms of pawn islands after bishop takes e4. Black has multiple pawn islands, and essentially the problem with pawn islands, it means more potential weaknesses to try and cover up later. So black's actually got four pawn islands and white three here. So the bishop is slightly better than uh, this bishop. Magnus, in, in the post-game uh, press conference, thought he was slightly better here. We've only referred to as static advantages, so those are the longer-term advantages in the position. So in terms of his better bishop and better pawn structure, he indicated if he could consolidate, he would be able to put serious pressure on, on Black's position and play for a win. However, he starts to go wrong now in his, his own admission and allowed some serious counterplay. So let's see what happened. We see the move rook h f one to start off with. Now rook b five looks to be a very very interesting active move from Vichy. It creates all sorts of interesting uh, possibilities. So very interesting move, uh, including immediately like rook e five to put pressure on this this weak e three pawn potentially. Now rook f4 for Magnus. The rook's a potential tactical target though on f4 to g5. And in fact, this is what's being played immediately now, g5. 
potentially it does loosen the pawns a bit to start advancing them although they can be dangerous it can be a bit looser potentially on g5 now white avoided getting his rook entangled something like this looks like a very artificial move rook g4 even though it's not immediately obvious how to exploit that if e5 that blocks g5 and rook takes g5 is possible uh, so but uh, if black played h5 then this rook's really not in the game this this would be quite comfortable for black this sort of position this rook is just looking as though it's it's in trouble it's stranded so that's to be avoided um, the rook simply now just goes back to f3 so in a, in in advance of rook, any rook e5 which is kind of skewing the bishop and e3 rook f3 reinforces the e3 pawn if the bit if the rook went back to f2 then rook e5 that's a little bit more troublesome perhaps for for white uh, so rook f3 and we see now another very aggressive looking move from Vichy uh, which rules out one plan completely though he played actually h5 as mentioned uh, the possibility here of actually playing bishop e8 if that pawns left on h7 then bishop g6 is facilitated uh, so for example rook d2 bishop g6 and even if black has horrendous looking double pawns here there's some dynamic pressure on the h file engines actually think this is about equal this position here it's a very interesting position to play even though it's, it's a little bit on the ugly side of the structure it will be difficult to actually crack and maybe have some true exploitable weaknesses here than what it appears to be a very fragmented pawn structure indeed but it's an interesting plan so but this plan is ruled out because we see actually uh, Vichy playing h5 here so he's got a different plan in mind so he's moved that h pawn different plan in mind and now we see rook df1 so with rook df1 white is now threatening this invasory rook f7 check there's not too many ways actually of defending f7 uh, usefully uh, so bishop e8 not only defends f7 but potentially the bishop might be coming to h5 later after an h4 so that's one of the better ways actually to deal with it bishop c2 now is played rook c5 pinning the bishop and now threatening a concrete you know, bishop g6 just to use that pin now magnus guards the g6 square with rook f6 and one issue with rook f6 is that this this rook is now having to support that f6 rook so a little bit less flexibility for the white rooks h4 extends the scope of this bishop and provides h5 now for that bishop so this this bad bishop is a classical maneuver often in, in systems like the dutch stone wall where you have a bad bishop for it to wriggle out like this so this is kind of reminiscent of that and now we see e4 so magnus is trying to uh kind of parry this in a more longer term manner this bishop g6 if he can retreat the rook and that pawns in the way and try and bring his king maybe to support the pawn if needed He's trying to make sure bishop g6 isn't damaging when he retracts this rook. We see a5 from Vishing. So suppressing white's pawn majority a bit. This b4 might have been a useful resource. So it's trying to cut down white's play. Now king d2, which unpins but leaves b2 behind. And that kind of weakness of the last move is immediately uh, taken advantage of with the move rook b5 here. So what does white actually want to do? With, with the b2 pawn well actually here uh, king c3 might lead to an annoying check with rook c5 check and then just going back so actually Magnus commits to avoiding that sort of thing he just plays b3 to support uh, to make sure that pawn's not attacked and now we see the bishop indeed coming out to h5 which facilitates rook d8 check and we might get some potential coordination here on that d1 square if Magnus is not uh, careful in this position he plays actually king c3 stepping away from that check in advance but now rook c5 check the king has got b2 in this position though and it goes to b2 rook d8 now 
though it looks quite dangerous for this rook d2 infiltration that needs to be parried. It's parried now with rook 1 to f2. So keeping this bishop on f6 has a big advantage here to be able to use, for example, the h6 square. That's a concrete potential threat if white was given another move. So we see now uh, in this critical position at move 34, this is a move which both players had mixed feelings about. Vichy kind of regretted this move as pointing it as, as a mistake. He played actually rook d4, whilst Magnus indicated he missed this move and actually felt he might, he feared being worse even. It does suspend this threat of, of bishop d1. In this position, bishop d1 would have been, is, is a disaster. It's not possible to play bishop d1 here. It looks like a, a nice active idea to try and um, get rid of finally this bishop and, and keep the rooks active. But here it fails to rook f7 check. Um, if king d6, we could just take on d1 piece up. And if king e8, we just play rook f8 check. And then we can just um, either fling in the check or just take on d8. Flinging in the check is actually even better. And then and then just taking on d8. So that that's a disaster. So rook d4 uh, just facilitates potentially bishop d1. Black might want to ease the situation with bishop d1 here. We see now rook h6 and indeed bishop d1 is played. So this is now still from an engine point of view it's it's about equal. It's only a, a small a uh, very delicate advantage for white technically in theory. If white takes uh, this bishop then rook takes d1 looks very very on the equal side. If anybody's better, in fact, it's black. Black might have rook e1 now, and this pawn is looking vulnerable. This would solve a lot of black problems. Black's problems here. So we see a necessary move, just bishop b1, avoiding that exchange. Of course, leaving b3 behind, and that weakness of the last move is tapped into with rook b5. So what does white want to do about b3 here? Well, white plays a very clever move, just attacking the rook now with king c3. That's one way. Just attack the rook. Getting time. Uh, what to do with that rook in this position? It's protected with c5. And now Magnus plays rook b2, protecting b3. So, okay. And the white has here a, a tiny advantage still. Can he actually nurture it? He plays e um, white. Sorry, black now plays e5 because white is actually pressing e5 in this position with rook h7 check. That would drive the king back one row. The king's meant to be quite active towards the end game. So, but she didn't want e5 and rook h7 check here. So, I think this ex helps explain e5. We see now rook g6. And Maybe the obvious move for most most players uh, would be to do something about this g pawn, uh, not be too clever here, and just just play g4. It is it is after all supported by that bishop on d1, and it's hard to see um, how white significantly better. Uh, there's a tactical resource which which helps black here. For example, if bishop d3, black has rook takes b3 check here as a tactical resource. The bishop's kind of loose here. Um, and there's another uh, point about this coming up. Uh, so this this d3 issue uh, for bishop d3 is, is very interesting soon as well. Uh, but uh, let's see. After rook g6, we see a4. Instead of just simply protecting the pawn by by g4, we see a4. Is this a bit too clever? This move giving up the g-pawn for the b-pawn. It seems like a fair trade in, in some respect. Uh, so rook takes g5, rook takes b3 check. Is this a fair trade? Why why should white be slightly better here? After rook takes b3, bishop takes b3. There's rook takes e5 check now, giving white 
uh, temporary pawn up scenario. The thing is, it's if we go back here, it's, it's difficult though for White to try and consolidate uh, the position. Magnus wanted to stop um, counterplay in this position on move 42. If he had played bishop d3, trying to stop counterplay by playing this first and then threatening rook e5, this would be a, a tricky position for black if black didn't have a very, very nice uh, forcing move available in the form of c4. So this is a very, very clever idea which Magnus Carlsen demonstrated that rook takes e5 check here King d6, it looks as though white's winning the exchange with king takes d4. But in fact, after c takes d3, black is now threatening d2 and queening. Uh, so for example, rook f5, d2, we're just queening, we're just winning here. For Black's actually just winning here. So it's actually a very, very tricky position. Magnus perhaps didn't really want to play rook takes e5, but he had to in this position. Bishop d3 just doesn't do, the, do any do white a help here. So rook takes e5 check, king d6. You might think, well, it's it's winning a pawn, but it's activating the black king a bit more. And black still has some even even more apparent counter play rook d1 coming up off the rook moves now. So rook d1. We see now e5 check, which gives the bishop some possibilities. King, the king now is it's just very active. King d5, and in theory, this position here, even though black is a pawn down, in theory, the engines are giving this in a very high depth, equal, virtually equal uh, position. It's it's only a pawn down, but black's pieces, and the king in particular, is more active than the white king. We see Magnus playing bishop h7. And this might be the first key mistake, at least from a theoretical um, understanding of this game, from a theoretical engine point of view. What is actually going on here? Is this a pawn dangerous? Potentially, it is dangerous. It doesn't look as though that a pawn's going anywhere soon. It's like locked down. But in fact, the move rook a1 might be important here to, to knock out the a pawn. And give white what seems to be great, you know, two connected past pawns. It seems like a paradoxical idea to try and equalize this position. Um, so let's have a quick look. Rook takes h4, rook takes a3. If say check, king takes e5. It's difficult to see how white can, can actually win uh, this sort of scenario. Uh, if if we just follow this through a little bit, we move like rook uh, b4. We're gonna. It, it just looks as though black's doing okay. Both both sides pawns are holding each other. It just it just looks as though um, this sh this should be about equal this position. So it was curious here that this pawn wasn't knocked out. This was an opportunity to knock out the pawn, but instead we see rook c1 check. And actually, interestingly, uh, from the game four interview, I, I was a bit uh, concerned when when Vichy was was mentioning about being able to play checks to be able, be able to reach certain time controls. I don't think playing checks all the time is is a brilliant thing. Uh, here, this check might really be a mistake. This this particular check, there's no time control at the moment to to reach or anything. But um, putting the king on b2. He's, he's not able to get the a pawn now. He's instead going for the g pawn. And I guess intuitively, uh, the idea is to leave white with just two apparently useless flank pawns. They're usually very hard to, to win, in, much harder to, to queen in end games. And the king should be acting enough for e5. So maybe that's the idea. Uh, so bishop g8 check is played. King c6. And now. Rook h6 check might actually be one of the more accurate moves in the position that Magnus played here. If he had taken on b3, if, if Magnus had taken on b3, a takes, rook takes, we see a, a slight difference here. Uh, 
that the king uh, is a little bit more active than the game continuation. So, okay, after bishop g8 check, king c6, rook h6, and the king is going back here, it goes back actually to d7. Perhaps b5 can be considered, it's a very, very tricky, intricate position, in fact. If king b5 here, it does support though the idea that black can play for example c4 check so maybe this is something that Magnus wanted to avoid the king's quite useful for c4 check at minimum but um, he's encouraged actually Vichy to move his king to d7 now on move 48 and this rook is cutting off that king on the sixth rank so now white takes on b3 after a takes king takes b3 it still looks as though here that Vichy's intuitive plan has been realized which is basically to essentially try and leave white with potentially useless pawns very difficult to queen and the king can hold the e pawn and black still got the important c pawn and intuitively if white doesn't play this super accurately uh, this position after king e6 now White has to play extremely accurately, and what Magnus comes up with now on move 52 is it's actually a very, very strong positional sacrifice, which which engines really, really like. It's like I think one of the the only moves to maintain a significant advantage. If White tries to hold on uh, to the e pawn, let, let's say White just tries to materialistically just hold on to the e pawn, forget. Let's, let's not not use the positional sacrifice. Then how does white actually make progress um, after a move, say rook f2? It's actually difficult here for white to make progress. He's just clinging on to these two pawns. Um, say check, uh, sorry, check um, if king c4 rook f3 and if white drops like the a3 pawn then it's becoming closer to being a theoretical draw the king's a very nice blockader of that pawn and this this rook can go behind this pawn making it very very difficult to queen but what we see here is is what maybe is one of Magnus's really strong points in in end games after this king e6 he plays a very very powerful end game shall we call it an end game positional sacrifice he plays the move a4 and engines do really really like this move simply giving up completely the e e5 pawn which which will take the king a little bit further away from the, tri the triangle for where the king can rescue against the advance of the a pawn which is in a critical position here he plays actually king uh, takes e5 and after a5, Magnus was actually convinced this was definitely lost for black, this position. Uh, the rook's got possibilities of coming behind the pawn. This rook is cut off from that critical g3 square, so even the h2 pawn is doing a wonderful job of stopping this rook g3 check. So this is now very, very difficult for black. We see king d6. So is the king going to come into this triangle to try and stop the pawn? Pardon me, to try and stop the pawn. Curiously, I've been looking at some Reti compositions before the game because of the Reti opening being played, and there's a wonderful composition with with king and pawn endings, which which other composers imitated. So I wondered here, okay, the king is it just in time stopping this a pawn? But we see a very very cruel move indeed again for Magnus Carlsen. We see rook h7. So Magnus is like a, a supercharged Capablanca. He's also got properties of Alaska and, and an Anakine psychology and a fighting spirit and determination of, of Alexander Anakine, as well as the, the end game technique of Capablanca. He's cutting off the king here. And this, this pawn is just a total menace. If he can make this rook passive, then all he has to do is start advancing his H pawn to stretch Black's resources further and further. Vichy now played king d5 and now a6 is very simple it seems just 
moving the pawn forward. Pawns are meant to be pushed past pawns. C4 check. And I think the general expectation here, again, this is a magnificent move it's from, from Magnus, superlative uh, move. It seems intuitive, totally intuitive, to stop rook a2 here with the move king a3. And this is actually technically a good move. Uh, but it seems Magnus's move is might be even technically better. There might not be much in it. But king c3 was played, seemingly allowing this luxury of the rook to come behind the pawn. But we've essentially achieved the goal of making this rook passive anyway. The rook's kind of passive on a2. It should have been the king trying to blockade this pawn earlier. So after a7, white is just left with this long-term winning plan of just bringing this h-pawn up. And it doesn't really matter about this rook a3 check here. Um, for example, if, if rook a3 check, it doesn't really help black's cause. I could just play king b4, for example, if rook a1. And now we can build a bridge here of the check. We can play rook a5, for example. And because the pawn, the pawn is on the light square, that would be with check. So that's very, very cruel, this kind of scenario. That, unfortunately, the king is now too far uh, for the h-pawn here. You can't get back in time. Um, it's not Superman. So, so rook a2, even though it's been allowed by Magnus, it's still winning. It's tying down the rook passively, with rook a3 being harmless. We see king c5. Which seems to echo as though rook a3 is of more importance because we've got the opposition. It's not really. h4 is, is played anyway. And apparently Vichy resigned when playing king d5. I don't know if that was um, a move that was actually meant to be played. But it seems king d5 and, and resigning was in theory played. Now, if we look at this position with this rook a3 check, if king b2... Let's, let's say rook a4. White can relentlessly just stretch black further, put black on the stretcher with h5. If black tries to use his c-pawn here, then it can be kicked back all the time with a check. That's the annoying thing. The king can't really help this c-pawn. And then white puts black on the stretcher again with h6, just going to h7. This poor rook is just passive on one pawn. There's other pawns coming uh, to queen. So like this, for example. If we reach uh, this this scenario with h7, then black is now helpless. So we see after h4, king d5, and, and Vichy resigning. So it's the first decisive game of the match. A very, very interesting game. Uh, as though this amazingly complicated martial gambit variation of the semi-slav was going to be played, but it wasn't. White's opening advantage in theory wasn't that significant. Um, but um, he got a nice position to work with, with a superior uh, bishop. But uh, he did seem to give Vichy some counterplay. And it seems uh, at a key moment, the a-pawn, which could have been taken, was allowed to survive. And that decided Black's fate, that a-pawn, that humble a-pawn, was actually the thing which helps Magnus win this game and now take a lead in this match. So after the first four draws, the first decisive game in the match. Very interesting. The match has really come alive now. So in the subsequent rounds, uh, I think Vichyana is going to have to try and play for a win more aggressively to level the score. I hope you got something from that analysis. Comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.